This is recording. This is recording. Okay. We're recording right now. When will this be coming out, by the way? I don't really care, to be honest. I don't really care either. I'm going to be spontaneous about this. You guys recording without me? Oh, wow. It's not top of mind, if you know what I mean. Amateurs. My point was, I think maybe it makes sense to talk a little bit about... Insane. I look forward to seeing if in practice it's just as interesting as it sounds. Okay, I can do the intro, I don't mind. In which case, let's get cracking. Are we ready? Okay. Hi, this is the Troublesome Terps, the podcast about topics that keep interpreters up at night. Tonight, we're getting our geek on. We'll talk about using technology and interpreting with a very special guest. But first of all, let's welcome our usual hosts. Jonathan is taking a well-deserved break this time. After all, he already wrote a book about technology and interpreting. Hailing from beautiful Munich is Alexander Gansmeyer. It's just right here. AG says hi, so hi. <laughs> <laughs> and hailing from Brussels, but in a strictly private capacity, is Alexander Drexel. Yes, hi from Brussels, everyone. Hello. And I am Sarah Hickey. And here's our guest for tonight, Josh Goldsmith, conference interpreter and tech maven based in Geneva. Hi, guys. Uh, tech maven. Wow. <laughs> Set the no bar pressure. very high. I put, I put that in. <laughs> I, I get to put that in. <laughs> I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, so the idea was to bring Josh on board to talk about technology and interpreting. And um, if you've been around the block in interpreting and uh, maybe on Twitter as well, and the interpreting community, uh, you may know that, that Josh uh, knows a thing or two about technology and shares his knowledge as well online, offline, um, and he does so together with me. So that's just a quick disclaimer here. But um, first of all, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do when you're not sharing technology knowledge. Um, you're based in Geneva as a conference interpreter. I am indeed. I'm based in Geneva. I work here in Geneva for various international institutions, the UN, other agencies that are part of the UN family, and also on the private market for a handful of different clients, uh, and quite a bit actually for the European Parliament, and occasionally for other European institutions as well. Excellent. Um, but interpreting is not your first career, so I don't know, uh, since you do quite a bit of teaching, I think it might be interesting if, if you told us a little bit about your first <laughs> uh, your first career, as it were. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm trying to count the number of careers I've had already. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you want to go I, into uh, detail on that? No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> le let's let's put it this way. My first master's degree was in teaching of languages and literatures, and afterwards I worked for a few years as a language teacher. Actually, quite a few years as a language teacher, both in face-to-face -face settings and in online contexts. And um, yeah, taught English, taught bilingual education in Philadelphia, where I was teaching Spanish English uh, high school. And then after that, I moved into translation and then into interpreting. So I have been teaching basically for my entire adult life. That's a very cool thing to be able to say, isn't it? <laughs> that is absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And as you may have um, as you may be able to to infer from Josh's accent, he's he's not from Europe. He's from the US. Uh, but I think you've been in Europe for a long time now. Also for most of my adult life. <laughs> most of your adult life. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and I don't know about you, but I, I, I often get the... I often get the question of, you know, why why are you so interested in technology? And I, kind of, I find it difficult to, to pin it to something specific. I just find it interesting. And I have a certain curiosity. Do, do you feel similarly about that? Or is this, I mean, you didn't study computer science or anything like that. So that, hence the question. I didn't study computer science, but I've always been a tech geek. And I'm proud to say that I've always been a tech geek. Uh, <laughs> from the early days of my teaching, I was the guy who was bringing um, all sorts of tech-heavy solutions into the classroom. 
whatever that might have meant. I had students writing blogs and wikis and recording videos. And, oh, remember I remember wikis. <laughs> Yes, yes, from the good old-fashioned days of wikis before we had Google Suites. <laughs> and we have at least one other, I think, self-identify geek as well, which is the other Alex. I don't know about you, yes. you Sarah. Would you, would you self-identify as a technology nerd, geek, or a... Uh, unfortunately not, but I am very curious about technology and very uh, open to technology. But I think I was a little late to the game and only picking up now a little bit more. But yeah, definitely very excited about it. Cool. So we, we got the right topic for tonight. <laughs> but before we dive in, uh, Josh, I wanted to ask you one last question on sort of your professional background, as it were, because you're working on, on a very exciting project, um, which also involves teaching, interpreting and technology. And uh, in so far as you're able to tell us more about that at this point, I'm working on a handful of neat projects about at any given moment. Yes. Can, shall I just tell you about everything that's going on in my life right now? <laughs> no, just just the keyword Malaga. Uh, okay. Yes, uh, I'm very excited, actually. There is a brand new European master's degree in the teaching of uh, translation and interpreting. It's an Erasmus Mundus program, which was just set up this year. Um, it is run by three universities, actually. It's a consortium, and the University of Malaga is one of them. The other two are the University of Wolverhampton and the New Bulgarian University. And I will be going as a visiting scholar to teach on the Interpreting Technologies course. Awesome. And that's uh, about two and a half weeks from now. I may well be there when this episode is released. That's true. <laughs> and so that's a master's. That's not a postgraduate thing then. That's, um, or, or what is, what's, how does it fit into, let's say, interpreting studies in general? At what phase does it kick in? It's a proper master's degree. I think it's a 60 credit master's, so a full year master's, maybe even longer for the students. But it is not specifically designed for interpreters per se. It's designed for people interested in the technology side of our profession, for translators, for interpreters, all sorts of things related to natural language processing, um, ASR, so speech recognition, and much, much more. Got it. That sounds really cool. Yeah. I think we have to self-check tonight. If, we, if we're if we too heavy on the acronyms, we have to be a little bit careful <laughs> with the NLP and ASR and what have you. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to spell it out there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You did a good job. <laughs> Just as it's a good reminder for us as well. I mean, it's a very interesting topic, that's for sure. But it's it's sort of difficult because technology can mean so many different things, right? I think the, mm. the, the question is really where, where do you start? Because technology is so pervasive, both in our personal and also in our professional lives these days it's kind of difficult yeah. to know you know what does it actually mean technology i think especially when it comes to interpreting oftentimes it kind of gets mixed up because it's such a broad term that some people immediately go like okay it's going to be about rsi remote simultaneous interpreting see the acronym explanation <laughs> or it's going to be about different types of headphones or different types of booth technology or extraction software for preparation. So you really have to be very specific when you talk about technology and what you're actually talking about. Otherwise, things get quite muddled quite quickly. And I do feel like that in interpreting and not only in interpreting in most industries now, uh, technology is touching on every part of the job and on so so many parts of the job uh, in lots of different ways like you already said Alex um, and yeah actually I am still looking into that a lot for uh, my my day job as well at NIMSI we look a lot into interpreting technology in different angles and yeah I couldn't agree more like uh, with you Alex um, that some people get super scared right away, even though you might just yeah. be talking about, yeah, like new standards for headsets or something, you know, <laughs> like something <laughs> very non-threatening. Yeah. <laughs> so, just, and I mean, uh, since, since at NIMSI you cover both translation and interpreting and possibly other parts of the language industry as well, um, did you see any differences in terms of technology adoption, com you know, looking at interpreting and then maybe at other parts of the language industry? Was there something that sort of was immediately obvious that there were differences in terms of how the people in that community adopt technology? Well, I'd say from the side of uh, translators and interpreters, there's definitely been a lot of um, resistance. 
But at the same time, uh, we're also reaching a time where it's becoming more established. So we, especially in the translation industry, um, working with all sorts of technological solutions is the new norm uh, that is already completely established. It doesn't mean that uh, human um, translators are not needed anymore, but they work increasingly with technology. Um, and it's starting to be a lot more adopted by clients as well. I mean, though I think the development in machine translation has kind of plateaued a little bit. As at the moment, it doesn't seem much of an incentive to invest a lot more for no better outcome, uh, even from the large players. And in interpreting technology, there's so much happening at the moment. And it's an odd mix because there's some technologies that are maybe not that great, but others that are done really professional, that really surprised me. And then there's this mix in the community, some that are really, really resistant and others that are starting to at least dip their toe in very carefully and see, oh yeah, maybe it's possible in this in this scenario. So I think that it's a fascinating space to watch because there's so much happening at the moment. Like It's really hard to even keep up, but fascinating. Nowadays, it's almost impossible to talk about translation without talking about CAT tools, computer-assisted mm. translation tools. But when you start talking about interpreting, you don't always hear people talking about CHI tools, computer-assisted interpreting tools. And uh, that's perhaps a bit surprising. I mean, CAT tools have become the norm, but they're not quite there for interpreting, even though I would argue that a lot of interpreters are actually using various types of tools to support their work, even though they're not calling them CHI tools. Yeah, I guess they might just fulfill a different uh, function than what, uh, you know, CAT tools are doing for uh, translation, but I can see um, what you mean by that. Um, and yeah, and then the other aspect is that when we looked into interpreting a little bit more in the last year, it was kind of like, well, in, in terms of development, especially when it comes to like technology or maybe the adoption of technology, it seems like it's usually translation starts and then after a while interpreting follows Yeah, <laughs> yeah. a little totally. bit. Yeah. That's like, that's maybe why there's more adoption there already. But yeah, it seems like interpreting is uh, catching up really quickly at the moment. I think the, the big thing in, in translation is also that there's, I think as you just said to some extent, Sarah, is that there's a bigger push both from clients or clients in the sense of agencies or big um, sort of language service providers because simply for sort of efficiency and productivity reasons, they will... I'm going to say almost force, I guess, some of the freelance translators to adopt these tools because they, they are just part of a big workflow, um, not to say a cog in the machine, but, you know, uh, to some extent, they, they just have to adopt these different tools to be able to to be part of the, yeah, either the machine or the value chain or whatever you want to call it. And I think that that is maybe not as urgent um, a need in interpreting, but I think that um, that's also yeah. Josh doesn't agree with me there. <laughs> but well, I, guess, yeah. I think it's it's Just sort of changing already because I'm I'm thinking about the paperless push yeah. and the fact that all of these institutions are now giving their interpreters a service device, often a tablet, and saying this is your device, this is what you're going to work with. We're not going to give you paper copies anymore. You guys so get a free tablet? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> oh, that's good to know. <laughs> no, but that's really good. But I think that that might actually really help us, at least in the in the institutions. I think what really drove the translation market, though, is that exactly what you were saying, Alex, that um, and also Sarah, that the big agencies, the big players, really focused on those two things, and that helped with the standardization. I mean, I know there's tons of different CAD tools out there, but really, the two most prevalent ones probably are SDL Tratos and MemoQ. And I don't know if if um, we have an equivalent when it comes to um, computer aided in, or com sorry, computer assisted interpreting. Hmm. In terms of you have to have this one or that other one um, app, tool, program, or whatever. Yeah. Just to add to this quickly, that I think one of the things that really contributed to uh, the uptake of machine translation in uh, the translation industry is not only that it started to get so much better, uh, but also that there is uh, such a crazy demand for content and there's more and more coming out all the time. Right. Now also what we talk about with uh, media localization, the amount of online content and video content is just absolutely booming at the moment. It's like virtually exploding and they're like trying to catch up. You know, everything needs to be like faster, like you want it to have. Oh, yeah delivered yesterday with better quality for cheaper and huge and, volumes yeah 
yeah. So, you know, even just to handle those crazy large volumes, uh, it does make sense to um, use technology to your advantage and then still have um, human translators, of course, involved for like uh, post editing, things like that. Or transcreation is a huge field um, that's also picking up more and more at the moment. And what's what's your impression? Because we, we sort of talked about this a minute or two ago. Um, not to say that people are afraid of technology necessarily, but do you see sort of a change in mentality? Do you see more openness among colleagues to adopt new tools, especially Kai tools, stuff like that. Do you see that changing? Is, is our interpreter still sort of behind the curve a little bit or are we sort of catching up now? What's your impression? Because it's something that we see in training courses as well, you know, where, where we sort of see the questions and, and the attitudes of people coming to the courses, for example. I think more and more colleagues are starting to use technology as part of their daily work. I get lots of questions on a regular basis about it. I see more and more colleagues coming into the booth. I mean, rarely do I see a colleague go into the booth or go to an assignment if you're doing consec or what have you without some kind of technology in hand. Right. So I do think technology is on the rise. I mean, it makes sense. It helps us do our of jobs. Of course it does. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> huh. And Alex, what's your, what's your impression sort of uh, over the years? You've, you've, you've been in the business for a while. Did, have you noticed any changes or were Did you... Did you just call me old? <laughs> no. <laughs> experience. I called you experienced, exactly. <laughs> But just just saying, did did you notice any changes, or did did you start at a point in time where sort of people were already getting getting on the bandwagon, as it were? I feel like it depends on what you're accustomed to from your from your studies. Because so my batch of interpreters, like all the people that kind of graduated around the time when I graduated, everybody immediately had a laptop. Like that wasn't even a thing. Like you wouldn't even go into the booth without a laptop. Now, a lot of the younger interpreters immediately come in with a tablet because they're just used to it because they used it in their, uh, you know, at their university, at their training courses, wherever they did what they did. And I think that has definitely changed. I think though, just the fact that we have the hardware doesn't necessarily mean that we use the technology for our job because you know everybody uses their computer laptop tablet or whatever in order to get the emails to get the job because otherwise we sure. can't even do it or for invoicing <laughs> yeah. but oftentimes like that's where it ends you know oftentimes people have like uh like their terminology as like a word document and, Cringe. and that's it like you know <laughs> we'll like that's that. where the whole thing ends and yeah. that's why i feel like the question do you think people use more technology is like a yes and no kind of deal this is the moment where i have to qualify as old because when i was in university we certainly didn't use laptops in the booth i mean we, we would maybe use them in in some sort of classes or lectures but it's a it was very rare <laughs> so just uh talking about old and stuff <laughs> i don't personally speaking really see much of a difference between colleagues when it comes to their ages um older colleagues and younger colleagues tend to show up with a device in hand um, mm, yeah, and I I think it's the ones who are more interested in learning how to make the most of their device that are taking advantage of all of the different very cool features available to help us do our jobs better. Agreed. Regardless of their ages, it's more of a mindset, right? It's not an age thing. That's what I noticed too. Absolutely. Uh, and just to say, I mean, we don't need to get into uh, big detail on this uh, right now, but we'll put a link to the show notes to an article that I use all the time uh, when, you know, I get a brief, you know, can you can you say something about technology? Can you do a training on technology? Um, there's a great article written by Barry Olson, friend of the show, I think I can say, which is called Interpreting and oh, yeah. the, the T-Word. Um, and he basically subdivided the whole technology thing into oh, yeah. three different categories so one is technologies that help deliver interpretation which would include you know the conference technology microphones headsets and that kind of stuff um then the whole augment category which is what we'll think um i think we'll focus on during today's episode uh kai tools uh terminology and so on and so forth and then the third category would be the technologies that are at least uh, trying to replace um, human interpreters all together, which is not really the, the brief for tonight. We're going to cover this uh, on a different episode uh, very soon uh, because it's also the topic <laughs> of Jonathan's book. But um, yeah, if, if you're trying to sort of get to grips with the whole technology thing, um, that's a very good place to start to sort of get some, some tools and some categories to make sense of the whole thing. And I'd probably slot 
most of the remote interpreting discussion into the delivery category, not into the augmenting what we can do or replacing us category, but it's just another way of delivering right. our services. Definitely. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But we sort of promised ourselves we wouldn't talk too much about remote <laughs> <laughs> because we've yet. covered that several <laughs> times yeah. on the show. So. It's and the you can only say so much. Given. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I don't know, Josh, what do you feel like? Should we talk a little bit about tablet stuff, which is kind of our... Uh, our uh, Ooh, hobby tablet horse stuff. Or, uh, that sounds good. <laughs> sure, we can, and we yeah. can talk tablets till, <laughs> till, till we're blue in the face. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and we, we did a, we did an episode <laughs> last year, right, with uh, with Andrew um, yeah. about uh, working with an iPad and um, consecutive. Well, the focus as well. of the exactly the yeah. focus was the consecutive, but exactly. then it kind of became into like an like an iPad fanboy meetup. <laughs> totally, yeah. <laughs> um, but that, that's, there are actually quite a few things that we can do um, with an iPad and, and not just using it as a as a digital notepad. So I'm wondering, Josh, is, is there a favorite thing, a favorite activity that you that you really enjoy doing on a tablet? Or definitely reading documents, marking them up in advance. Um, I use my tablet all the time to prepare yeah. for assignments. Alex nodding heavily. <laughs> Yeah, heavily, like all the time. I mean, it's it's really cool that you can simply just write into the documents right then and there. And I mean, you could technically also do it on the on the Surface tablet. I used to do it when I had that, which was also really nice. But then the the form factor of the iPad, the fact that it's just so much lighter and and thinner, it's just it's just nice. <laughs> yeah, it is indeed. Yeah, and as Josh mentioned earlier, it's it's sort of a, a great time now to be using that since there is this sort of paperless push. Which yeah. I don't know, Sarah and Alex. I, I think on the private market, or for you, Josh as well, you also work on the private market. Um, I suppose it's much much less of a thing because obviously the documents would come via email or some kind of cloud service or whatever. Oh, yeah. But of course, in institutions, we're kind of used to having our paper documents properly stacked in the booth when we come in in the morning, that kind of stuff. So uh, maybe that's something where um, interpreters working for institutions may have a harder time adapting. I don't know. Well, I think it like depends on who you work for. I mean, most of the documents, yes, you get them via email before and, and there are no printouts. So somewhere on the, uh, you know, on the way to the booth, you actually have to kind of steal an agenda if you want to have one, like a physical copy in the booth. But then there's also other clients who say this is highly confidential. We can't send this out of time. So you get into the booth and you have literally a folder of printed out documents per interpreter. When we said multiple times, we literally only need one copy because we're going to share it anyways. <laughs> But um, and yeah, of course, of course, you also have the oh, I see that PowerPoint on the screen over there. Let me just uh, send the team yeah. leader and see if we can get a copy of that, so that we can. You just off you go with your pen drive and exactly. pray that they're willing to give you copies of the documents. Yeah, totally. And that has also become easier, um, I think, over the years, because when I started doing these tablet trainings, um, people would ask me, "Yeah, but what about you know when?" Somebody comes running into the booth five minutes before the whole thing starts and says, you know, here's my PowerPoint presentation. Do you want to copy? And then you say, yeah, technically, yes, but my iPad doesn't know how to deal with thumb drives. So that's kind of a thing that's that's easier these these days. So it's Thanks also nice to see. That is days so. are over. Thank <laughs> God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah i think it's also also easy now because they they may just send it to you anyway beforehand or you know just to send you um a quick email as well which is kind of nice um but you know it's really funny like the response you get when you just sit there on your and i mean like this is gonna i don't want it to sound like you know i'm showing off about the awesome cool tech stuff that i do but like you just sit in the booth and you kind of annotate your documents your powerpoints or whatever and like a colleague will literally this has happened to me multiple times now that i've used that i'm using the, the ipad more and more in the booth and they're just going to come over and they're going to be like what is this what are you using what apps are you using is that a laptop like what is that and you're just <laughs> yeah, like exactly. no this is an ipad let me show you how it works and then they want to try it out so like it's still it's still not the norm like people still aren't used to to seeing this yeah, and you know, I'm, I mentioned annotation as a preparation strategy, but I annotate all the time while I'm working in the booth live. Uh, I've got the documents in front of me. Maybe they're drafting. Uh, I, I often tell people about this in our training courses. I work in places where there are different groups. For example, at the ILO, which is tripartite, you have the employers, workers, and governments. And they're all trying to come to some agreement on a text, and they're drafting away. And uh, I use different colors to annotate right there as I'm going, either writing it in or typing it in if I want. 
uh, to keep track of the different edits as we're going along. So that, that's another way I'm using my tablet all the time. Maybe just one more thing I'm always doing with my tablet, um, in addition to just looking at the documents, is I always have my terminology open while I'm in the booth. I usually split my screen. And so I have almost always on one side of the screen the glossary that I've prepared for the assignment or the glossary I've prepared for various assignments for that um, for that client. And I can quickly look up a term in about two or three keystrokes, which is just brilliant. But that's still something that blows people's minds because when I, I, I just had this conversation literally today with colleagues and they said, yeah, I mean, I, we're interested in, in trying electronic documents, but I still find it, I still find it easier to find a specific part of the text when using paper documents. And I'm not saying this to make fun of people, I've, you, because obviously people are used to different things, people have different preferences, and that's absolutely fine. So I don't I don't try to be that guy who tries to sort of poo-poo people who don't go with the times, quote unquote, or you know, still s stick to their old paper-based workflows. Um, but it's just that I'm, I'm much quicker when using technology. And yes, I can even look up something in, uh, in a text or, you know, look up a definition online while I'm actually working during my shift. Um, and I think, again, that's that's something that um, still blows some people's minds. So, yeah. So it might just be a matter of, you know, what people are, are used to. You know, if you've always, like you said, had your process with your papers, then it might just require you to spend more time figuring out a new workflow when you're working with a tablet, you know, just to get used to it, just really invest that time. You know, if you maybe just try it once or twice, you might go like, oh, this is very slow because you don't know what you're doing. You know, it might just take a little longer. But I can, anytime there's a quotation or they're citing something, I can almost inevitably get to it faster by oh, just yeah. searching for three or four letters or the I'd article so. number or what have you. And then I can immediately read it out. Uh, the same is the case when I have, you know, long names of conventions and things like that, exactly. that I haven't memorized them all. I'm sorry to admit it. <laughs> haven't <laughs> memorized them all. <laughs> I have. I have memorized some of them over the years, but yeah. um, that's the kind of thing that I can just type in. I don't know. They start going convention 173. I type 173 and I read out the 15 word name of the convention and I can just free up <laughs> all of that mental space. I mean, from a right. cognitive load point of view, it's a tiny, tiny bit more yeah. when I have to be searching for it. But then, boom, I've got a five second walk in the park. Yeah. yeah I'd say the once you know. Really struggling. And in German, it's always just one word, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The entire name. A two pager. Yeah, yeah. A two page one. one word, exactly. <laughs> yeah. but, but I'm wondering if this is also a case of where sort of meetings and how meetings happen and how people meet change over time and that drives technology adoption. Because I, I don't know, maybe. My impression is that sort of in the good old days, there used to be less work on texts and more discussion in meetings. And I think, at least in my sort of evidential experience, I guess, um, there's, there's much more text-based work, as you said um, as well, Josh. And that also ha helps um, drive technology adoption because it's just so much easier to have the electronic documents, I think, for the reasons you just mentioned. I'd say like, yeah, once you have, you know, it down probably like you said josh you know i just need to quickly type in that then i'd say that is so handy because otherwise you'd be sitting there with your papers and like trying to flick through it really quick you know like a totally. digging you know so yeah I imagine that it's a lot more handy once you know how to do it just but you know to be fair i think the three of us the four of us we're willing to put in the time and effort to kind of make it work for us because you know it's that professional curiosity it's the tech curiosity it's like you have the the hardware and you want the hardware to do what you want it to do and what you need it to do. And oftentimes when people cannot figure out what they needed to do instantly, they're just like, oh, whatever, my old way worked. It was fine. I don't even need to change. And then they just kind of give up and, and throw in the towel and then never actually get to <laughs> that point where it would be faster for them. Which is understandable. You know, I mean, which can be, yeah, there's totally. only so much things you can do in a day. And we just like tech, so I guess we enjoy figuring stuff yeah. out. I mean, I remember when the exactly. when the iPad was really new, it was it wasn't uh, it wasn't at all intended to be used at work, I guess. But you yeah. know, I kind of enjoyed finding these ways and workarounds and stuff like that. Well, first of all, when I was a student, I did not have an iPad because I had uh, zero money. I was a very yes. poor student. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Same so here. no iPad. I had a notepad. So, exactly, I had a notepad, <laughs> like a no, like a paper With notepad. With an actual pencil. I had. Yeah. Um, and I still personally, for me, I love if I just 
take very quick notes, uh, even if it's for my post-its. I yeah. like pen and paper for that. But if I'm working with lots of documents and presentations, like you said, Josh, you know, I would definitely want to use uh, a tablet, iPad, whatever, uh, for that type of type of stuff. You know, so maybe everyone just needs to figure out their own little system. But I do think that overall there is something to be said for going with the times because otherwise, I mean, you could get stuck in some kind of scenario like, I don't know if you guys know this, but most doctor's offices in Germany still only have fax machines. Like they don't even have email. Oh, don't get me just started on boss. faxes in Germany. Oh. I mean, yeah, it's yeah, just an example, but it's die. like, you know, these are, you don't want to be those people. It's not just doctor's nothing against offices, doctors, though. There but, are so many companies you know, in Germany that still run on the fax machine it's crazy but you can have them digitalized by now but yeah fax you can send fax from a computer but why would you <laughs> yeah why would you when you can send an email no but honestly i think it's true like sir what you were saying you should go with the time it's very beneficial but then i'm thinking and that's why i said what i said i have a lot of colleagues here who you know they're doing translations they're doing interpreting they have two kids they need to pick them up from soccer bring them to school bring them here and there and i know for a fact they simply don't have the time nor mental capacity nor willingness to figure all this crap out because they have other stuff to do. And you can't blame them. You can't say, you should really sit down and do a webinar on how to, you know, annotate documents on your <laughs> iPad for an hour and a half because that's going to really help you in the future. I They're hear like, there's no, good webinars about I need that. To, yeah, yeah I, I, I heard there's <laughs> well, really good online courses. Plus, it's you know, not like it's... Dinner or whatever, so... Yeah, it's and it's not like it's important for us that other people use this. It's just, you know, something no, I know. that people no, but, would maybe recommend. But if it works for them, then yeah. yeah. But but I I say this time and time again in the training courses that I run, you don't have to go and try to learn all of this overnight. Pick one thing yeah. that interests you and take the time to learn how to do that one thing. And then once you've mastered that one thing, move on to whatever the next thing is. This might actually be a really good segue, Alex, into <laughs> our... Why we've changed our approach to online CPD and what we've done, if you want to go in that direction right now. I love how Josh is pedagogically structuring his his points that he's making. It's very good. Yeah, that's a teacher coming in. <laughs> I can't help I it, heard. guys. I can't help. I'm a teacher at heart. <laughs> this was actually a very nice segue, but I'd still I'd still like to get to the to the unconventional tech solutions <laughs> first because um, it sort of dovetails nicely with what we just talked about is is using technology to do um, things. And, and um, sort of the, the first step often is sort of using technology to emulate what you've done before, but just using technology to do that. Like, for example, you don't use a paper-based notepad anymore, but you just your, use your tablet to take notes, for example. But that then eventually can also lead to sort of new developments um, in interpreting. For example, um, I get a lot of questions actually actually from interpreters and also from interpreting trainers about uh, SimConsec, about simultaneous consecutive using um, the smart pen, for example, this, this um, sort of specialized pen that can uh, record the pen strokes and also audio during a, a presentation or during interpreting. In fact, um, and Josh and I have also demoed um, how to do that on on an iPad. And those are sort of interesting developments. But as far as I can tell, so it, sort of in my line of work, at least, they haven't really made a big dent I in interpreting practice. That's at least my impression. I've always wondered about SimConsec because it seems like such a logical thing to do. I mean, as an interpreter, why wouldn't you do it? The only thing that it does is potentially improve your performance. Like there's, to me, no, there's no, no downsides not, not to it. Not potentially. I <laughs> promised I wouldn't talk about research too much, but the research on this shows huge improvements. That's in what I'm, yeah, that's what like I mean. 33% improvements in performance in, in a study that Mark Orlando did on, on this, one of his first studies. It's just like huge. It's amazing. <laughs> so like to me, there's, there's no downsides for us. The only thing that I've always worried about is what the customers think or the clients think when all of a sudden you're standing there and you know they kind of have an idea what consecutive interpreting is because a lot of people have seen movies or whatever or they think they know yeah. and they expect you to stand there with a notepad and a pen and then you stand there with your iPad and your Apple Pencil and you have headphones in because you're going to be listening to the recording and they're Hang thinking on. Like, we should, we should is probably happening? explain real quickly what SimConsec is for those who that's haven't that's a very heard. good point <laughs> don't you think you can tell I'm not a teacher yeah I don't know how to do stuff <laughs> yeah Josh you, you want to bring us up to speed on this one Sure. There are different approaches to SimConsec, but the basic gist of it is that you record the speaker while they are speaking, and then you work from that recording 
after they've finished speaking. Yeah, so it's a typical consecutive setting. Um, e exactly. Yeah. The difference is, and this is where that research has gone in different ways and how people explain SimConsec goes in different ways. Uh, the differences have to do with whether you take notes. If you take a full set of notes as if you were doing consecutive, if you take a kind of partial set of notes that will just you know, jog your memory or perhaps uh, allow you to go back to a specific moment in the speech you want to listen back to, because that's another thing about SimConsec is you can click on a spot in your notes to just listen to that little bit one more time uh, before you get started. For example, I have to check that name one more time. I have to check those figures. Click right here where I put that little star. Okay, I heard it. Yeah, it was right. And now here I go right back to the beginning and off I go into my simultaneous working from the recording. Yep. So it's a, it's a hybrid mode, if you will, uh, between Absolutely. simultaneous and consecutive. And it was interesting to see the reactions because Josh and I did a training course. Well, Josh did a training course the other day and I got to sit in. Um, and it was interesting to see it the was reactions. Awesome that you sat in. <laughs> <laughs> it was interesting to see the reactions from some people because some said, yeah, but, but that's cheating. And we said, <laughs> You can say either no or who cares, but you know, the, as you said, Alex, the, the the important thing really is whether it works for the client. If the client gets a good result, I mean, the, there is no cheating in that way. If you do yeah. your job, uh, i.e., you know, enabling multilingual communication, there, there is no cheating. It's fine. And I mean, to be fair, you charge a lot more for consecutive than you charge for simultaneous. So if, you, <laughs> yes. if you get the consecutive rate and you actually do the simultaneous job, like, what's not to love? <laughs> yeah, and it's like I feel like we sometimes forget, you know, that we're not interpreting for the sake. Of of it and for the art of it as much as we love it we do it for uh, to enable communication and if that's the outcome then well that's done but so then let me ask you this and i'm purely playing playing devil's advocate here but why wouldn't you just have your phone out click on a recorder app record the speech and then do the simultaneous like why even go through the motions and take your notes or you know even have a notepad in your hand or an ipad or whatever you have you know you might have a smart pen whatever, but why not just have a recorder app and then listen to the recording? That's definitely SimConsec, as far as I'm concerned. It fits the bill. You are working from a recording after they finish. That's my definition of SimConsec. Oh, okay. What you do with notes is up to you, and you could take none. Now, some people might call okay. that uh, troublesome, but... <laughs> You've come to the right place, my friend. I've come Very to the nicely. right place. Very as far as I'm done. concerned, that's what SimConsec is. However, it may well be in your interest to write down some things for the same reasons that I was mentioning earlier. You've got right. the numbers on the page in front of you. So when that number comes up again, uh, you're working from German, the numbers are all backwards, what have you, not to pick on the Germans in the room or anything. <laughs> Fair <Never>. enough. <laughs> for, for, the used to it, it's fine. <laughs> for, for the record, I'm actually German, but that's a long story <laughs> that we can <laughs> talk about some other day. That's for the after um, show. Exactly. Um, so writing down those numbers, writing down those names could be very useful. Writing that, putting yes. that little asterisk in your notes to listen mm. to that bit one more time before you dive in could be useful. Being able to click on a specific stroke to go back to part of the speech could be useful. Um, in fact, something that could be quite interesting, they've repeated themselves. You know, well, this bit is useless. You take the notes on it, then you just draw a big line through it. And when you're delivering it, you get to the point where you've gotten to that chunk that you're just going to skip because it was repetitive and you click below it to go to the next chunk. Yep. I mean, that's what consecutive is about, is summarizing. Is so I think yep. that the technology could could actually help to improve our performance in that regard. But I think that's, that's, really that's cool. a point that yeah. is sort of underexposed in the whole dis discussion about SimConsec because um, I don't know if he was the very first one. I, I believe so. But a, a colleague from the commission from the Italian booth, I think, was certainly the first one who, who did this in public. Uh, Michele Ferrari did this for a press conference in the, I think, in the 90s when Neil Kinnock uh, was European commissioner back in the day when the UK was still a member. And he used he used one of these uh, PDAs that were sort of relatively new, a personal digital assistant um, back in the day. And he then also adapted the whole methodology to um, using this with a smart pen. And the cool thing with a smart pen was that you could do things like fast forward, uh, rewind. And he very much sort of focused on um, sort of the compression aspect, so of the consecutive aspect of the SimConsec. So it was actually uh, more of a hybrid than it sometimes gets uh, sort of presented as um, these days. So he would very much encourage you to fast forward through the redundant bits or jump to things that, you know, that you crossed out, as Josh just explained. So 
the, you can also slow it down if you exactly. want to hear a bit slower or speed yeah. it up if you want to hear a bit faster. That's really cool. The, too. the slowing down is really cool, especially if you have uh, um, fast speakers, which can happen, as we all know. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, mm -hmm. But I, not to belabor the whole point, but I think it's it's just a, one good example of, of showing how sort of adopting new technology also sort of can lead to new outcomes, which is interesting. And um, I don't know if you want to go into the site consec as well, Josh, which I'm much less familiar with, but it, it's worry. kind of a cool, cool idea. So maybe tell us a little bit about it. Nobody's really familiar with it because <laughs> as far as I know, it's not happening, but it's this really cool idea that I want to be happening. Yeah. So I keep talking about <laughs> Let's it. Let's share it with the world then. Yeah, tell us. So I guess the idea of site consec is you're recording the speech just the way that you would be recording a speech in SimConsec. The difference is that as you're doing it, you're running the audio through voice recognition software, speech recognition software. So in real time, there's a transcription that's being generated. And then you either use that transcription or some parts of the transcription to help you in your work. And what do I mean when I say some parts of the transcription? Well, there's technology out there that can just pull out the numbers and make them appear on the screen as it's going along. Wouldn't it be great if you could just take a quick look to check uh, or actually take that cognitive load, that piece of the cognitive load out of the picture, not have to spend so long thinking about the numbers, it's just on the screen as you're going along. Uh, so the idea is you would get some sort of support and maybe it's a full transcription and afterwards you, uh, you site translate it from the full transcription. Or maybe it's just a list of names and numbers, or maybe it's also um, the terms that were in your glossary popping up right there with the translations next to it. So all of that, I think, could help our consecutive work. You wouldn't be working from the actual recording. That's the difference between sim consec and site consec. Instead, you'd be working from the transcription of the recording or some components of the transcription mm -hmm. of the recording, not working exclusively from it, but using those as a support for your work. Yeah, it's like a little bit of an aid while you're doing uh, your usual job. Uh, that kind of reminds me a little bit of some, I know we're not going to talk much about remote simultaneous and video remote and all that, but I know some companies I talk to, um, they offer that as a feature to their interpreters as well in the booth. That there's like another screen where you can either get transcripts or numbers or even sometimes uh, translations and things like that that can that interpreters can use or not depending on what they want. But also to ease a little bit of the cognitive load if people want it. So I think that can be really useful. Yeah, I mean RSI platforms are building in these Kai tools uh, into their platforms to help the interpreters do their jobs. Yeah. Exactly. And why wouldn't they? I mean, the technology is there. And since you're already working with uh, technology in that matter, you know, it's it's an extra feature that you can choose to use or not. It's up to you. So. Exactly. Um, I, th I think you were alluding to Interpret Bank there, Josh. So maybe that, that will be a good next topic to uh, to get to uh, because you, we just mentioned the speech recognition and highlighting of, of numbers and stuff because, um, yeah, was, was that something that you were... That was on the I, back I, of your mind. I was alluding to it. <laughs> yeah. um, Interpret Bank is probably the tool on the market that, that, that has best developed speech recognition for interpreters and really built it into a, a suite of different tools. Uh, that a good way of calling it, yeah. Yeah, well, because they've got a suite of speech recognition related tools, but also a much broader suite that does all sorts of computer-assisted interpreting automatic glossary generation, all this stuff that we can talk about yeah. maybe when we talk about terminology. Hmm. But the the piece about speech recognition is basically what I was just describing. Either you can get just the numbers that are pulled out and provided to you on the screen, or you can get numbers and names, for example, New York, Greenland, Ice Sheet, what have you. Uh, or you can get the terms from your glossary. So you've already prepared a bilingual glossary. And as it goes along and it hears, I don't know, the word for climate change, uh, that's what I mean by that is the transcription tool is working, right? The speech recognition tool is working. It hears climate change. It's always checking this, everything it's transcribing against your glossary. And it says, oh, climate change is in your glossary. So I'm going to print climate change and the equivalent in whatever language you're working into on the screen. Uh, and it's very fast, actually. The latency is 
certainly very feasible for our work. I mean, we get it fast enough that we can use it. That's a question I often hear is, well, isn't it four seconds too late? No, nope. it's not four seconds too late. It's <laughs> yeah. quite fast. It has fast. a shorter decalage than we do. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it could be. And uh, quite, quite often it has a shorter decalage than we do, exactly. Interpreters are famously terrible at numbers. I'll be troublesome again. <laughs> no idea I think what you're talking interpreters about. Interpreters <laughs> tend to be quite poor at terminology as well. As somebody who's a bit of a terminology geek, there's a lot of colleagues who aren't necessarily using the word that was in the documents that we were given in advance. They're using a very valid translation of the word, but not necessarily the one that the client wants, which could lead us into a whole nother conversation here. And at point being, wouldn't it be great if you're prompted with, oh, the client wants me to say X for Y whenever it comes up and that word is there and you don't have to think, oh, what was it that it's called in this organization or for this client? It's being provided to you. Uh, so I am fully in favor of these tools that will help us to do our work. Of course, there's a question of potential distraction and there's certainly a learning curve, learning how to use it. Perhaps sometimes you look at it, perhaps sometimes you don't. It's the same thing when it comes to simultaneous with text called SimText. Um, you can use the text, you can just prepare the text and then set it down and not use it. I mean, there are lots of different arrows in our quiver as interpreters. And the question Nicely is, which put. one, thank you, which one do we use at any given point? Um, if I may be a, a bit of a, a research geek for just a second, I'll say that there's some very interesting research coming out looking at uh, prompting interpreters with numbers. That's the first piece that researchers have targeted, um, giving you the numbers. And basically, um, accuracy goes way up when you're given the numbers, when you don't have to process it. Uh, that was the first study that uh, Bart DeFranc and two colleagues of his uh, did. And the second piece uh, study that he did with Claudio Fantinwoli just recently, which has yet to be published, but basically what they're finding is that the tools are very accurate in giving you the right numbers and they give them to you quick enough. So that's a, I think it's a real boon for us. I think there's a few aspects there that, that um, we're probably not going to, figure out during this podcast episode, but that I think merit further research, I think, which is a standard phrase saying is that would be, there's a space for more research here. But one thing, for example, is, is the whole question of um, sort of confidentiality, because uh, many of these tools that are sort of freely available now, and, and Claudio says this all the time as well, is that they're cloud-based. So they're sending the, they're recording the audio, sending them up to a cloud service like Microsoft Azure or, um, you know, Amazon uh, cloud-based services, services for transcription, for translation, and, and so on and so forth, and sending them back to to your computer, if you will. Um, but I think Interpret Bank also has a, an offline sort of solution. So I think he's playing with different approaches now. That that that's something that needs sort of sorting out. I think, but the uh, the technology is certainly very far advanced now and is very accurate. And I think the other the other point that um, you alluded alluded to a little bit, Josh, is the whole question of cognitive load. So is this actually helpful or is it more of a distraction? And so I think that that'll be interesting to see as these tools sort of get more established. Um, what is the What does the adoption look like? Do people actually appreciate that? Does it take some getting used to, which I suppose is the case, or is it more uh, of a distraction? So that's going to be interesting to, to observe how that's going to shake out, I think. I can't I wait. A... <laughs> yeah. So I just have a very technical question about how, so if you do this, this, the speech recognition about the numbers or about names or whatever, like how, and you're sitting in a booth, right? So you have Interpret Bank running on your laptop and you're sitting in the booth. How would Interpret Bank get the original source audio? Because if I'm in the booth, I only get the audio on my headsets. Yeah, it's just the same thing you plug into the console, right? To plug in your headphones. It's just a cable that you plug in in the same spot and run to your computer. That's it. Right, so you get a splitter and then you put it... Okay, yeah. That's it. Exactly. Makes yep. sense. So the wiring it up isn't that complicated, actually. <laughs> no, right. It was just like that. Yeah, makes sense. And then the second thing is um, what you were saying, Alex, is that, you know, you just have to do it and... I'm just thinking about this because I just did an IEEC webinar about, you know, technology and interpreting, and they were wondering about what they should teach interpreting students. Should they, should they do this or that? all sorts of with like directional microphones when you're doing whispered interpreting with like a tour guide system. Um, 
I think you should always be prepared for the worst case scenario. You know, when you can't bring a computer, when you can't bring a tablet, when you can't bring your your phone, if you're used to relying on that speech recognition to fix your numbers or your names for you, then all of a sudden you're out of luck. And I was thinking that all throughout the webinar as well, you know, when they were saying, oh, we can do this, we can do that, we can have like eye tracking and then the eye, you can like trigger terminology search with your eyes, you can have like, <laughs> yeah, and you know, cognitive load aside, I'm just like, yeah, but then if you teach your students that, they're probably only going to use that at university and maybe on their laptop and just nobody else is going to have that. They're, they're just going to be all alone with all of that stuff. So I don't know. I think all of that technology is really good to be aware of, to know it, but not necessarily to rely on it. Isn't that always the case with technology? Yeah. I mean, like just because we have Google Maps doesn't mean we shouldn't have a regular map in the car anymore and not know how to navigate with it, you know. In oh, case well, then. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I don't I mean, know if that's sorry, a good example, just, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a I don't have a car, but you know I, I don't have a map either. But I mean, living in Ireland, I can tell you, if you're out uh, somewhere very very remote, you might have no connection anymore, and it's certainly not easy to navigate there. So you need well, to even go. in Germany, you don't have reception just outside of Munich. Yeah, that's true. But I just mean in general, whether it comes to the cognitive load or how much we're reliant. On, so uh, those are two points. Number one, with a cognitive load, um, I think maybe that's just a matter of preference. Later, you know, as in everyone probably has to figure out their own system, just because it's you know, it's there doesn't mean you have to use it. It just means you can. And I'd say it would be very useful. But yeah, if I, as an interpreter, find it too distracting, I mean, no one's forcing you to use it. You can do old school, you know, the way you like it. And then same as when it comes to teaching about new technologies, uh, you should, I, I would say, I mean, I'm not a teacher, but I would teach it alongside it and always emphasize that you need to be prepared in case the technology doesn't work and you need to just use pen and paper and your memory for consec or, you know, old school for sim, but that it's really useful and important to also teach the new technologies and show people what's out there. I think that's, that's something that's sense. very important to <laughs> No, that's absolutely right. And that's something I hear a lot from from trainers is that there's a little bit of a of a fear, I think, that that um students may run the risk of relying too heavily on technology mm. to the detriment of having proper technique, if you will. Um I don't think that's necessarily going to happen, but I can totally understand that that's something that uh, particularly trainers are afraid of because with interpreting studies these days, there's very little time actually to really um, teach technique and, and have enough time to practice it and let, really let it sink in. So that there may be a temptation sometimes to use technology actually to sort of plaster over sort of weaknesses and technique maybe. I don't know if that's uh, the right way of putting it, but I can certainly understand that fear. I mean, like if, when it comes to your exams, for example, you know, you could still do, do, do all of those old school, um, whatever that means. I mean, you know, <laughs> exactly. uh, but, you know, you could have an extra module or um, make it available for people um, to learn about technology. Again, I'm not a teacher, so I, these are just, you know, me thinking about well, this right now. <laughs> so well, I, I would counter that argument and I would say every interpreting school should be teaching their students about technology, about how they can use technology effectively, about how they can use technology to improve their work, and also about what, what technology, most visibly in the form of remote interpreting, but in the future in the form of machine interpreting, might do to our profession. Uh, I mean, can you imagine a translation degree that didn't teach people about CAT tools? Oh, no, it's definitely in not. Interpreting degrees need to be teaching people about mm -hmm. technology. And I don't mean that they, we shouldn't be learning the skills that interpreters have been learning for, for generations. Of course, we need to be learning those skills. But we also need to be learning about changes in the profession so that we can harness them and oh, use definitely. them to improve yeah. our work. Yeah, yeah. Then it goes to what Alex was saying as well, right? Then it's either going to be a denser curriculum or it's going to be a longer education because while you need to tell them, and I agree completely with what you were saying, Josh, like I think as well that they should be taught about the technology and about not necessarily in, in all the detail about all the different options that are out there, but definitely give them an overview of what's out there and then go in depth with some of the stuff. But doing all of that on top of what you're doing anyways in your interpreter training might just blow the regular curriculum. I beg to differ. 
Yeah. We're learning how to do consec. I can teach people how to take notes, like the introduction to taking notes on a tablet in 15 minutes. Um, we're learning about, right. yeah. we're teaching students about <clears throat> using glossaries. You, I mean, about building glossaries. That's a fundamental part of every interpreting degree, I think, learning how to do terminology, terminological work. Teaching them how to look stuff up is really fast. I mean, literally, I could teach that in five minutes, 10 minutes. Yeah, well, I mean, when I said, for example, that you shouldn't, you know, should, that you should be old school in the exams, I didn't mean that people shouldn't take notes on their tablet. I mean, I'm pretty sure like someone in our class also took notes on her tablet for or her iPad for the exams as well, because, yeah, because they were just like, well, it's just the same as paper, so it makes no difference. Um, so I just meant like supporting what uh, Alex was saying about you need to have your basics down, but... Um, I agree I'm, with you on that. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know, 100%. I'm the same. But I was just gonna say I do agree with you about um, the importance of technology on all angles, whether it's the computer assisted assisted interpreting uh, tools or about RSI, VRI, machine interpreting, all of that, because it's not gonna go backwards anymore. We we are. Yeah more and more in that direction and we need to be prepared. And I think that also That's goes into the point, cognitive yeah. load discussion, right? I mean, if you're used to it from the very day that you started your interpreting training, you're not going to necessarily get the cognitive overload when you're dealing with technology and your, your tablet, you get the prompts from whatever it is that you use for speech recognition. You're going to be used to that kind of stuff. So the cognitive overload isn't necessarily going to happen. So I think we should I would rather teach the students and then not have them use it. Then all of a sudden there it is and they have no idea how to do or what to do with it. Yeah. I, I said, I can teach people to do this in 10 minutes. I didn't mean that was it. <laughs> no, yeah, of course. Course. <laughs> you got to practice yeah. it many, many times before you roll it out an assignment. And I say this all the time. That's what we have Don't home try now. this really hard stuff <laughs> on your most complicated assignment. Try it with a client, you know, well, um, in a meeting that you've done many, many times where should something go wrong, you'll still be fine. Where the, I mean, using this big term cognitive load, where the cognitive load is lower, basically. So you have more space to deal with this and then slowly build up to it. And I would say the same thing about teaching students to use technology. Yeah. But I think just, just one last thing, maybe on the teaching bit, I think one aspect is also that um, some trainers also I think have difficulty teaching technology because they're not really used to using it either. So for them, it's sort of a double challenge uh, or, or an additional challenge is that they basically have to figure technology out um, and learn it as well and then pass it on to their students as well, which also is a, is a pretty big challenge, I think, a, a pretty big task. Maybe. Which, you know, makes the whole thing more I mean, I, I kind of think that maybe someday the project that you and I are working on might help to fill some of those gaps. I was just going to uh, say, so, you could invite yeah. some outside experts <laughs> like yourselves. <laughs> yeah, and, and a lot of universities do, actually, to be fair. And uh, it's also part of the, the cooperation that we have between the European Commission and the universities, for example. So a um, lot of moving parts there. Um, basically. What a great segue now. <laughs> to what? <laughs> to what? <laughs> to uh, something to CPD? Maybe online CPD, online CPD? Yeah, yeah, maybe. <laughs> this, this, yeah, this is definitely something that is very close to close to our heart, and where we have a few uh, plates uh, spinning, I guess. Indeed. By the way, I love that we're announcing our great segments the whole time. <laughs> segways, segways. It's, it's a very explicit <laughs> signposting. Know, you know? That we it do makes here. them even yeah. better. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. For, it's good for the chapter markers when I edit. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, yeah, Alex just said earlier that he he was attending. Um, uh, a webinar and I get the impression that uh, and I may be biased I because I, I I do a lot of webinars as a trainer but um, I get the impression that a lot of interpreters really appreciate having the possibility of doing online CPD sort of on top of quote-unquote normal CPD or real life CPD or whatever you want to call it where you travel to a certain location for a course for example but I think online CPD is a is an, is a is a great compliment and, and a great addition. Anyway, because um, we lead busy lives, you know, we travel a lot and sometimes it's difficult to make time for CPD and webinars work very well for certain topics and, and it's easier to fit them into the schedule and you don't even have to necessarily be there for the webinar. Uh, sometimes you can just watch the recording after the fact, which is really nice. But do we? 
I mean, to just to play troublesome again. Yeah, no. Um, I have paid for many webinars, not managed to make it on the day of and not watch the whole recording or just skipped around and looked at the bits that might look interesting. And this is one of the reasons why Alex and I are not 100% convinced that webinars are the best arrow in the online CPD quiver. Uh, they are an excellent <laughs> potential tool, obviously, and I do plenty of webinars myself. Alex and I have put together a little project called Text Forward, um, and it's not about webinars. It's about on-demand online CPD, broken up into short bite-sized chunks, short videos, three to five minutes. It looks like a MOOC, a MOOC being a massive online open course where you watch short videos, and there's a lot of research that shows that nowadays that's more or less what our attention span is. Um, but also, we're busy professional interpreters. Maybe we take a 10 minute break in between sessions. Maybe we've got 15 minutes before our assignment starts that we're not desperately cramming the documents <laughs> during. And having the ability, maybe you're on a train or on a bus and you've got five minutes to watch a video. I think that is the right direction to be going in for CPD. Watch it once, watch it twice, watch it as many times as you need to till you have the time to really master the skills. That's another problem with webinars, I'd say, is that um, at least in my case, there are so many things I want to cover. And I've, I deliver this packed hour of training where I just touch on so many different topics. And from a pedagogical point of view, acquisition must be very low. People walk away with ideas, but don't know how to do anything. Uh, whereas if you break it into bite-sized... So much input. Yeah. yeah, it's just overload. But if you break it into bite-sized chunks and then have people do exercises afterwards, if they want to, that's a real way to ensure acquisition of the skills. And we did a, a little pilot project on our first course that we ran on the Tech Forward platform which was called Tablets for Wordsmiths, Five Tried and Tested tools, tools to Boost Your Productivity. And we found that that was the case, that people were telling us they really like bite-sized chunks. They, they, they found them to be interactive, which surprised me to no end because I said, well, it's online. How is it actually interactive? But I think the interactivity might be, I pick how many times I want to watch it. I pick when I want to pause, when I want to pause it and try the same thing out on my device and then go back to it. Um, so I, I think that this is a very positive direction to be going in. Yeah. And, and I think it's important to note that sort of these online courses or webinars, I mean, there's different topics, of course, that can be, that can be taught or can be learned about. Um, and I think it really, it's really important to sort of adjust the way you deliver the content to the actual content, obviously. So, you know, if, if, if it's a webinar about, I don't know, uh, looking back to the whole uh, GDPR, <laughs> hashtag GDPR um, discussion, there were a lot of webinars telling people sort of the basics of the GDPR and what they need to know and what they need to implement in their everyday business. And that maybe doesn't have to be that interactive. You, you give them the information, you give them maybe a checklist of things that they need to be aware of and things that they need to do, and then they can go home or, you know, sleep on it and implement it the next day or whenever they get around to it. But um, we're a lot concerned a lot with technology. And of course, that those are skills that you need to practice to be able to master them. So I guess that's, that's where the sort of interactivity comes comes into play but um we've just sort of assumed now that interpreters want to do cpd and and are interested in cpd but that even that's not necessarily a given um so there are maybe very few but i think there are some interpreters out there who think you know once you once you get your degree um that's it and of course you know maybe you learn a new language or maybe you learn about a new topic but overall you don't really need cpd because you know how to do simultaneous you know how to do consecutive you can you can make a glossary and that's it but um yeah i mean at the risk of stating the obvious but that's not the case i mean we need to <laughs> no <laughs> we need to keep our skills sharp we need to keep them up we, we want to learn new techniques maybe you know just like using tablets for work for example or adopting paperless workflows so Again, at the risk of stating the obvious, I think CPD should be part of any professional career of any interpreter. And I think it's also, we tend to be very curious people. So I think it's it's kind of a natural 
like an obvious thing for interpreters to do CPD in all kinds of ways, you know, about topics, about languages, about techniques, about technology, whatever it may be. Yeah, absolutely. I would say that uh, this is true for all uh, like the whole modern uh, business world, but especially for interpreters. I mean, we have to learn so many new things all the time, even just for different assignments. Um, and uh, everything is really, really fast. And I, I like your approach with the bite-sized chunks. Um, we have taken similar approaches at uh, NIMSI for some of our content as well. And it's like, people love it. They just like prefer it so much to have something short with like one main piece of information that they can digest, walk away with, and then come back for more later if they want to. Because yeah, so many studies have shown again as well that the attention span keeps dropping. It's already super low and it just keeps going down. Um, and yeah, people love uh, videos uh, that they can come back to as well. That's and definitely... Can I just take a moment to tell all of the people recording webinars out there, please, please, please include video in your webinars. Yeah, like a webcam, yeah. There is nothing more boring than looking at slides while somebody drones on over them, like a voiceover and slides. Come on, please <laughs> add video. If you didn't notice, that's a bit of a bugbear of Josh and I. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's that's what we're trying to, to set in. Yeah, but uh, just to say that um, CPD, of course, is not all, not only sort of a... Um, a demand side thing, but also a supply side. There's a supply side aspect to the whole thing. And um, there's a lot of CPD out there. But um, in my view, I think that could be even more that is sort of tailored for interpreters in terms of techniques or, or topics as well. I mean, a lot of associations do webinars now. Um, some of the, I, but but I get the impression that the bulk of that, at least, is sort of aimed at translators. So it's about um, CAD tools, for example, or um, I don't know, maybe topics that are sort of legal topics or business topics. There's lots of business and marketing advice out there, but I get the impression that there isn't all that much that is really tailored to interpreters. I don't know what your impression is, Alex or, or Sarah. I think it's getting more and more just because it. The more specialized you get in a training, the better it is to put on, well, it depends on the, the length of the training, obviously, but potentially the more specialized the training, the better it is to put on a webinar because you might not have enough people living in Munich if you're doing a super specialized training, like on-site training, or people willing to travel to Munich, and then it's just better to put on a webinar, people can log on, and then actually the training will take place, but um I think there's more and more webinars coming around as well. Also for the reason that we mentioned that you can record them potentially and then check in on them whenever you want to, whether that's good or bad is up for discussion. I tend to agree with what Josh said. And I, coming back to the GDPR, I think I paid for um, not, not only one GDPR webinar that I actually <laughs> didn't end up watching, but yeah. You're yeah, not going to uh, tell us how many. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Alex it was more than one. Let me just say that. Too embarrassing. Uh, yeah, I we do still have the recordings out there on my computer, and one well, you day, can still watch them. one day yeah. I will watch them. Well, Probably. is it really necessary anymore to watch the GDPR webinars? I'm not. I so don't know, sure. but it's on my CPD bucket list now. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> at the very bottom of that list. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. May, maybe I'll just chime in for a second. I think there is a serious dearth of professional, ongoing professional training, continuous professional development for interpreters a serious lack of CPD. There's just not enough out there. Obviously, at least the two of us think that there's not enough out there because we're working on so many CPD-related projects and you even started um, a manifesto at the conference in Geneva, which we covered on the show here as well. So um, obviously we think that there... Are, so we're not saying that what that what's out there is, you know, all that is bad or whatever, but that there yeah, should no, be no, much more not. choice, I think, also available. I think it's just difficult because it's always supply and demand. And I think interpreters are a notoriously fickle bunch and they're also very flaky in their participation in any given <laughs> thing. Yeah. And, you know, just, just with today's webinar, like it was literally down to the last minute if it was going to make it or not. And I already sent an email saying I wasn't going to make it. Do you have a recording? And then turns out my job got canceled. So I, I made it. And it's just very difficult for interpreters to commit to 
well, anything, not just anything, training, any, to, life, anything, basically. Yeah, to life. So, <laughs> podcast you know, recordings. trainings, yeah, tra- <laughs> yeah, podcast recordings. Um, so it's, yeah, chicken or egg, like, which one is it? But it, it's certainly clear that asking somebody to travel for training is a big ask. And of course, there are benefits to it. Um, being able to sit in the right. room with the trainer and work one-on-one, and also, of course, the networking aspect and seeing another city and so on are, are benefits of on-site training. But it's a huge ask. And so mm-hmm. I think that there's a real market for um, online training. And we're working on it. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, especially since we are already traveling quite a lot and everyone's really busy, it makes sense to also offer more and better training online and like what you guys are doing and these uh, shorter videos that people can come back to or, you know, uh, l- like listen to or look at uh, on their break quickly or, you know, on the train, like you said, it makes complete sense. I mean, that being said, I was just at a training on site in London uh, from Evandro, the interpreter career boot camp, and that was really good and you know, great to be in the same room and network. You know, I also wouldn't be able to do this all the time now, but this one time that I did it, it was really good as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And in in my impression, because we talked about uh, webinars and, and cat tools and terminology tools, I think um, a very sort of popular topic for uh, webinars is terminology tools. At, at least I get the impression that there's a big demand among interpreters now to learn more Firstly, to, to to see what kind of tools are out there in terms of terminology, what what other people use, what colleagues use, um, and to learn more about the ins and outs. And also, since um, a lot of these tools now are no longer just glossary apps, but but suites uh, that include much more functionality, I think that's a, a topic that becomes much more interesting um, uh, as well. So maybe we we can talk about terminology um, a little bit as well. And we said earlier that um, it's it's a very important part of interpreting. And that's I know that for a fact, because we do surveys as well with our in-house customers, if you will, the people we work for. Terminology is, is like way beyond all the other topics. Correct terminology is really the a key part or a key factor for judging interpreting quality. Um, so I think terminology is something where we also, is something that we should work on as interpreters. Yes, a hundred percent. That was more of a rand, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was perhaps a segue if we're announcing our segues. If you want to make it explicit, <laughs> that was definitely intended to be a uh, segue, yes, into terminology. Um, because that's that's also, a, I mean, it's one aspect of technology and it's, it's one aspect of tele- technology that's been very interesting to watch over recent years because there are a lot of tools now that have sort of popped up over the years. I think one one sector was um, RSI solutions and the other was sort of glossary and terminology software where a lot of interesting things popped up and some were really specific for interpreters, by interpreters. Others were just interesting and sort of cool apps that can be used as, as terminology tools. So yeah, let's talk about that yeah. a little bit. I know there's definitely a lot out there and you know like this is not my section uh, at MIMSI <laughs> but we have um, like my specific section but we have a whole terminology management um, system and tool kind of um, section on our website so my colleagues are for example constantly looking into that side for the whole language services industry and there's so much on the market as well again I'm not an expert on this side but I know that there's a lot out there because we have a special section dedicated to it actually <laughs> so and I know that some people will say well what interpreters do that's not really terminology but that's a different discussion let's we, we, sure. we're referring yeah. to glossaries here that's it um maybe <laughs> <laughs> no what i'm saying is because if you ask a proper terminologist they will say no what you're doing are you guys gonna hire me i'm being rather troublesome today <laughs> yeah. Yeah. sure <laughs> <laughs> glossaries are part of the picture um the way you get to those glossaries i think is another key part of the terminology terminology picture um it's not just about it some glossary being out there it's about building the glossary and how we build it and i know um Alex G, you said you were interested in terminology extraction. Mm. In fact, I did what I believe was the first piece of research ever on terminology extraction tools for interpreters, uh, which I presented at a conference in Cologne about a year and a bit ago. And we can add the link to the slides to the show notes as well. The article is coming out very soon. But before we get to that, maybe I'll just say 
to paint the picture, I think terminology has been was the beginning of interpreters looking at how computers could help us in our work. So Kai Tools really started there, looking at how we could build glossaries and manage our glossaries. And more recently, that as technology has developed, we've been looking at how we can use tools to help us to build them better, to extract terms. So maybe I'll just split it into those two categories. The terminology management tools are the ones that help you find the term you need very quickly. Um, you can easily search for what you're looking for. That's the key thing that sets terminology management tools for interpreters apart from terminology management suites for translators and for others. And actually, I think that maybe has a lot to say about how interpreters do uh, terminology, but maybe we'll get there later. Um, what's, what's important is that these tools need to help you find the term you need very quickly. Um, so they have what's called dynamic search. You type in just a few letters or a few numbers, as I said earlier, and you can easily get to the term you need in real time. It just pops up as you're going along. Um, what's also quite cool is that some of the tools specifically designed for interpreters now do what's called fuzzy search. So if you have a typo, they um, recognize that you have misspelled something and find the word you actually meant. So you're in the booth, you're working, you're trying to keep track of everything. You only have time to type those three letters. And hey, um, you've misspelled the word you were looking for, but nevertheless, your tool tells you what you were looking for. Or you and didn't use really the, cool. the proper umlaut or something like that. <laughs> well, yeah, well, they, well, that's another thing, actually. You don't have to use umlauts and you don't have to use characters or accents. Um, you can just ignore them, which saves a ton of time, yeah. especially if they're not um, something that you grew up with. I mean, there are no accents in English, really. Uh, that are written, diacritical accents written on words. So the fact that I don't have to type them and I still get the words I'm looking for saves me a ton of time and uh, pain and suffering <laughs> when I'm in the booth <laughs> trying to find the tool, I, the, the term I'm looking for. Um, just a few other things I'll tell you. Um, these tools let you look across various languages. So you can have multilingual glossaries, not just a bilingual glossary, but a multilingual glossary. And a lot of them work offline as well. So you don't have to have an internet connection. You can simply prepare your glossary in advance and then you go and you're working in a bunker, you know, three stories underground or what <laughs> have you, or I don't know, in a field um, or in a factory. And you're looking it up from your cell phone where you've stored it in advance. Uh, all of this is possible. And that's among the many amazing things that terminology management tools can do for us. Shall I stop there before I start talking about terminology extraction? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, yeah, I just wanted to get something in then we can get to extraction because um, I hear that sometimes is that people say, yeah, but, you know, building the glossary by hand uh, during the preparation phase is actually much more important because that already helps you memorize the terms and that's all fine and dandy. But the thing is that um, sometimes you just have a last minute job and, you know, Maybe you already have the glossary, uh, but you don't have the time to really cram the terms or, you know, prepare a lot. And then, you know, it's an absolute lifesaver if you have that glossary available in, in a tool that gives you results in, you know, fractions of a second. Sure. Or you've got your glossary from an assignment you did a year ago. Or from a colleague, um, in fact. Or yeah. from a colleague. I mean, that could be useful. The thing about a glossary from a colleague is you don't know what's in there. So yeah. if you start typing <laughs> exactly. something, you may Don't not find it. what you're looking for <laughs> because it may not be there. Um, so if you get a glossary from a colleague, it's at least a good idea to read through it once beforehand. So you know, oh, I'm definitely not going to be able to remember that. But I remember that in that glossary, there was something about this convention and you start typing it and there you go. Uh, then, then it's not like a wild, wild goose chase, right? <laughs> exactly. Um, Pandora's box. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. And and while we're at it, let's share glossaries. Um, let's oh, yeah. share the burden. Let's build glossaries together collaboratively. Um, and I mean, that can be as simple as a Google spreadsheet where everyone can chime in. Uh, I know another colleague who knows a lot about terminology for interpreters, Anya Rutten, has been really rooting very hard for this. Pardon the terrible pun. Um, <laughs> Love it. <laughs> but I think it's great. I think students should be doing it and I think professionals should be doing it, working together to really get that terminology right for our assignments um, 
and make sure we're all on the same page too. Um, so I'm all in favor idea. of collaborative glossary building and management. And just one thing real quick. I mean, that there are tools that already sort of focus very heavily on the whole sort of social aspect of glossary management, if you will. Like if you look at um, Interpreters Help, for example, which is a web-based glossary solution, they have this, what they call the Glossary Farm, which is an interesting name. But that is basically uh, like a hub where people can exchange glossaries and collaborate or work on glossaries collaboratively and, and together with other users, which is a really neat idea. And what's really cool is you can go search for a glossary when you're working at it for a new client or on a new subject, you search for a glossary, you find one you like, maybe the languages are, maybe it's missing one of your languages. You make a copy of it and then you add a column to add in that other language and off you go. Yeah, You've got a starting cool. point yeah. for building a glossary and then you can flesh it out and tweak it and do whatever you want with it. Um, I think it's great. I think it's very interesting. And maybe we should say, Alex, on Interpreter's Help, that I've written a few reviews of different um, terminology tools, and that's one of them. And we can put that in the show notes, too, if people want to read a very long review that goes into <laughs> a lot of detail talking yeah. about everything that that tool offers. And I think they may even had, have added some features since you wrote the review. <laughs> so they're pretty active. Uh, um, I am 100% certain they've added features. Yeah. Just last week, I discovered that they added a feature where you could email uh, glossary in you get a dedicated email address that you send it to and it uh, it just um, automatically uploads that glossary instead of having to go through all the rigmarole of uh, clicking add and adding it and so on and so forth for uploading you can just do that via email so they're constantly rolling out new features it's quite cool and just on the on the the point that we just had about sort of last minute assignments or maybe getting uh, um sort of huge amounts of documents. I think this is where the whole sort of automatic term extraction would then come in, right, Josh? What a segue. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, segue sorry, time. did I spill it? <laughs> so terminology, terminology extraction. I think that there are basically two branches of terminology extraction. One that you do by hand, which I call manual. When I say by hand, um, I don't actually mean like with pen and paper, I just mean that you personally are going through a document and you're pulling, you're, you're highlighting basically the terms that you want. And then your tool will, you know, spit them out for you, put them in a single um, column or a spreadsheet for you with just that one column where you've got the terms you want. Um, what's very cool is that you can do that bilingually and multilingually. So there are quite a few tools that allow you to do it bilingually where you've, you're working for a client. If you're lucky enough to be given the translation of the text uh, that you're working with, you just look at the two side by side, you go through and you highlight the term in one language and then highlight it in the other and you hit enter. And that's it. It's in your glossary. It's so fast. And for the people who might be naysayers, I think, I mean, some people like to write things on paper, but for me, it's about the act of actually finding it myself, highlighting it myself, and adding it. That pretty much does it for me, but of course, they're all different kinds of learners. So if you're the kind that likes to write it on paper, you can do that too. Um, very that cool. That is literally my dream. Like what you just described, like <laughs> this is what I need in my well, life. But your dream is a reality. Yeah, I know, but I'm just too lazy to actually like look at stuff. And that's why you I just need to do people like you on, on the that. podcast. That's why I bother <laughs> Alex on everything. Yeah, I know. I should. I need to. But there are none out there who cover this kind of stuff. No, uh, I, know I, can, you guys are I can think of at least three it, tools that allow this allow you to do this. Um, Intragloss, Interpreters Help, and Interpret Bank all have parallel manual terminology extraction features built into it. The latter two, so Interpreters Help and Interpret Bank, have multilingual manual terminology extraction, which means you've got your documents in three different languages or four different languages. And as you're reading, you just highlight, 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 enter, done. Next, highlight, 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 enter, done. And let me just give you guys a tip. I only read the document in one language as I'm going along, not in all of them. And then when I find something that's a term, that's when I find it in the others. So that significantly saves time, not having to read all of the documents in all of your languages. Um, so that's manual terminology extraction. The flip side of the coin is automatic or semi-automatic terminology extraction, where basically you give a document to a computer and you tell the computer, find the terms for me. 
And it can do that in different ways. It can do that. Uh, well, there's a lot of algorithms and stuff, which I won't go into, but the gist of it is it goes in and it finds the terms. It finds uh, monolingual terms and it finds so single word terms and multi-word terms or term candidates actually. And then you, well, term candidates, because sometimes it's gibberish or sometimes it's an acronym that, or sometimes it's something we all know. For example, in a document from the European Commission, it's probably going to find commission because commission is overrepresented in that text. So here I go on the algorithms, but it's comparing it to a big corpus of language and what you expect to find. And it's saying, wow, commission's in here an awful lot. That's probably a term. Um, but I mean, we know that. So um, the point is, however, that the, the tool goes through and it finds term candidates, things that might be the terminology you need, and it offers that up to you. And it does it really fast. Even with a document that's 100 or 200 pages long, it does it in a minute or even less. And this can be a huge lifesaver. Um, often I work, for example, at the European Parliament where I'm on a committee hearing where there are eight different topics covered over the course of two hours, maybe 10, 12. I wouldn't have the time to uh, read every single document on all, on all of this, but I do have the time to quickly upload the documents in one or multiple languages and then see um, potential terms. And it's a huge lifesaver and I strongly recommend you try it. Um, one other tool that you might be interested in trying out, which is uh, also very inexpensive and works well is called Sketch Engine. We can put a little link to that in here too if you guys want. <laughs> yep. Um, but but that's the gist of term extraction. If you want to learn more about this, read the article that I've just written, which basically tells you that every assignment is different. Every interpreter looks for different things and there's no perfect tool out there on the market yet. So a big opening here, um, build <laughs> yeah. us the tool we need. Uh, avoid giving us 60 hits of the word commission when we don't need that. Um, and and um, yeah, make terminology work for us. <laughs> I thought you were going to say make terminology great again, but <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thankfully you didn't. Uh, oh, Alex. Oh, very we are not nice. getting into politics here. Nope, 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 nope. nope. Uh, no, but I think that there were there were some good tips here, and I, th I think we we both had a, a hard time trying to avoid this becoming a, a course or a, <laughs> a training session. But yeah. it's it's just something that we're very very passionate about. Um, but um, it's been definitely a really cool sort of exploring. A lot of different aspects of technology. Um, I think we could have we could have talked for two or three more hours easily, <laughs> but uh, maybe we can, we can revisit the topic at some point, which is something that we we like to do. I think there are a few takeaways that we that we can sort of repeat, which you used along the way, Josh. For example, one that I really liked is that um, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by technology. Um, and I think it's it's a good idea, as you said, is to sort of start small. Um, yeah. And I think you said, you know, pick something that interests you and sort of start from there. Start with one skill or, you know, one thing like how to build a glossary, for example, um, and then take it one step at a time. I think that's a good, a good lesson. Um, have fun. <laughs> that is a this good one, be, though. Yeah, it, it, it should be really fun. Good one. Yeah. I mean, this should be fun. It shouldn't be a burden. Um, it can really help us with our work, but go out and explore. Don't stress out about it and see what works for you. And as Alex said, you know, take it one step at a time, start small, but always do it with a positive approach. Don't be afraid of technology. And don't be afraid of CPD and don't think you're, you know, too good to be doing CPD. And that's something that I, I'd like to repeat and underline as well, once again. Okay, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Very nice. And yeah. we'll see you on the next episode. Thank you like very much for inviting me, guys. It was great having you, Josh. Thanks. It yeah. was great. Thanks, Josh. This was awesome. Bye, guys. And I took notes just enough so that I would be able to have a legitimate argument for saying it boosts performance by 33%. You know, I, I did that too, though, during my uh, first uh, recording when I wasn't the troubles group did, yet. Yes. I had my laptop, I had like other notes, and I was like, I got all my research. All the notes. Right. She did, <laughs> she yeah. Had all the like notes. See, report. look, re research geeks unite. <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs>